Now you've asked me to join in a discussion with Professor Avery about the most difficult question that we face as human beings. The exact expression of the title is Reason in a Place of Pain, the Compatibility of Faith and Reason in Light of Suffering. And I've been overwhelmed in the last couple of days just watching the TV news from the Philippines. A short time ago, I arrived in Christchurch, New Zealand, two days after the earthquake, and had to meet people who'd lost their husbands and their wives just a few days before. Suffering is extremely real, and there are no simplistic answers. But you'll notice the emphasis on reason. Because when we suffer or when we see pain, our reason cries out, I nearly said screams, for explanation. And so we're going to try and look at that. And look at it with as much sympathy and empathy with those who suffer as is possible. Evil and suffering come from two logically distinct sources. Though in practice these sources are inextricably bound together. The first is suffering for which men and women are directly responsible, such as 9-11, and leads to the problem of moral evil. The second is suffering as a result of natural disasters, disease, earthquakes, tsunamis, cancers for which human beings are not so self-evidently responsible. And that leads to the problem of natural evil, or the problem of pain. So there are two sources, but there are also two perspectives. It's one thing to be an oncologist. It's another to be told that you have three months to live because you've got terminal cancer. There's the inside story of the person who's suffering the indignity or the pain or the disease. And there's the outside story of those of us who watch from the sidelines, maybe, and observe it. But then there are two approaches to it, or are there, indicated by our title, Faith and Reason, but they're actually not two approaches. Because faith and reason, properly understood, are inextricably bound together, because faith, contrary to the modern perception, is not a religious word, merely, and it does not mean believing where there's no evidence. The word faith comes from the Latin fides. It means trust. And of any trust in anything, any proposition, any person, any idea, you, of course, ask the logical question, what are the reasons for your trust? And I'm here as a Christian who believes in evidence-based faith. And we need to realize that when people look at suffering, some think that the only option is to believe that there is no God. So their faith is atheism, which is every much a faith system, a belief system, as Christianity. Others believe in God in spite of the suffering, so that their belief system is theism, in my case, Christian theism. The crucially important thing is to see that it's balanced. Both of these worldviews are our belief systems. And the issue is, which is the most reasonable in light of pain and suffering? In other words, what way does the evidence point? Which worldview has the largest explanatory power when it comes to coping with these things? I say this because there is such confusion. I debated Peter Singer in Melbourne, and it was very interesting because he said, you know, my big objection to religion is people stay in the religion in which they're brought up. I had told them that my parents were Christian. And so I thought it'd be interesting to put to him the same question. So I said, um, tell us, Peter, about your parents. Were they atheists? And he said, yes, they were. So I said, you remained in the faith in which you were brought up. Oh, but he said, it wasn't a faith. It isn't a faith. I said, sorry, I was under the impression you believed it. 
Now that was very interesting, but it showed that he's bought into this redefinition of faith. You'll find it in Webster's Dictionary. Faith noun, believing where there's no evidence. And the result of the permeation of academia with that redefinition of faith is that people have become unbalanced and they think that Christianity is a faith but atheism isn't. And we'll never get anywhere with this question until we redress that balance and think that there are these two major worldviews, atheism and theism, that attempt to answer the big questions and they're both belief systems. So the proper question to ask is, how does suffering and pain fit within the compass of those two? So that's the way I'm going to approach it. The problem is so clear. David Hume said, Epicurus's old questions are yet unanswered. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then is he impotent? Is he able but not willing? Then is he malevolent? Is he both able and willing? Whence then this evil? And there are many people, and I count among them many friends, who think that events like the floods in the Philippines, the earthquake in New Zealand, or the Holocaust, and 9-11, examples of both the problem of moral evil and the problem of pain, show us that there is no God. In fact, some say even more, they think that religion is part of the problem of suffering because it causes so much suffering in the world. Indeed, Richard Dawkins says that 9-11 radicalized him. This is religion. It's a step too far. Therefore, in order to balance it, we have to abolish all religion. And when people say, but that's extreme jihadist religion, he says, but extreme religion thrives on the periphery of moderate religion. So the only answer is to get rid of all religion. And Steven Weinberg, who won the Nobel Prize for Physics, said the best contribution that science can make to this generation for that reason is to eliminate religion. He went even further. He said anything that we can do as scientists should be done in order to do that. And that sounded a little bit like a totalitarian threat that might cause a lot of suffering in the attempt to destroy religion. Now this is a question that we need to face. Of course it is a very foolish thing to put extreme jihadists and the Amish into the same category. We need to learn to differentiate just as it would be a mistake to put atheists like Richard Dawkins into the same category as atheists like Stalin. He wants me to differentiate. I want to ask him to do exactly the same thing. Now, I'm from Northern Ireland, ladies and gentlemen, and it hasn't the best reputation as an advert for the Christian faith. <laughs> and I need to explain a little bit of that because this is a question that I feel personally. My parents were very unusual because they were Christian without being sectarian. That's the first thing. And as an expression of that, my father insisted in his small business, and he was not an educated man in the contemporary sense, of employing equally across the divided community, Protestant and Catholic. That resulted in bombings. It resulted in my brother nearly losing his life, losing the sight of an eye, 300 stitches put in his face. So we know something about, a little about, the effects of terrorism, that is sectarian. But my brother didn't lose his faith, and nor have I. And it's very important for me to address this question head on, if you'll forgive me. What do I think of the violence in Northern Ireland and the impression it's given that Christianity is a violent religion? I'm ashamed of it. Utterly and thoroughly ashamed of it. But let me explain why. I'm ashamed that the name of Christ has ever been associated with the AK-47. Because when you read the New Testament, you find that Christ forbade the use of weapons to defend him or his message. And the irony of the modern position, and I put it to Christopher Hitchens, I said, Christopher, 
Your criticisms about the violence of religion are the same ones that Jesus made. If you took seriously what he said, you'd be on his side rather than fighting against him. Because the irony of this whole situation is that Christ was put on trial for what? Fomenting political violence. Exactly what the new atheists accused Christianity of. He was for it and he was exonerated by Pilate when he said to the Roman governor my kingdom is not of this world otherwise my servants would be fighting and Pilate realized he was no political threat especially when we, he went on to say to this end I was born and to this end I came into the world that I would bear witness to the truth and the hardened soldier and campaigner Pilate said what is truth I don't think he was being cynical, but I think he realized that if this was a king of the truth, he wasn't much of a threat to a political power-hungry governor. Especially, ladies and gentlemen, the kind of truth that Jesus represented. Because Pilate realized, you see, that the one thing you cannot do is impose truth by violence. Especially if it's truth about the love of God, forgiveness, peace with God. That's absurd. So I'm making two points. And the major point is this. People who take up weapons to defend Christ or to propagate his message are not obeying him. They're disobeying him. And therefore they do not deserve the name Christian. And sometimes when people say, well, there's rather a lot of this around, I say, look, the existence of counterfeit money doesn't prove that the real stuff doesn't exist, but it can make it hard to find. And it seems to me that's very important. Now, other religions, I speak as a Christian tonight, I can't start defending, and I shouldn't. They have the right to defend themselves on this score. But it's very clear that at the outset, Christianity was a non-violent religion, so we cannot accuse it. But there's another side to this question, ladies and gentlemen. Richard Dawkins loves to quote the song by John Lennon. Do you know the song, Imagine? Imagine a world without, well, actually, when he quotes it, he talks about imagining a world without the Taliban and without Northern Ireland. How could you possibly imagine a world without Northern Ireland? I mean, that's absurd. But okay, let's take his point. But you see, I'm not John Lennon. I'm John Lennox. <laughs> and I've written a song, and it's called Imagine. Imagine a world without Pol Pot. Imagine a world without Mao Zedong. Imagine a world without Stalin. What about that world? Now, here's a very interesting thing I discover in atheist writings. Virtually no mention. The 20th century is airbrushed out. And yet, there's no excuse for a single person murdered in the name of religion. But the multi-millions that were murdered in the name of an atheistic philosophy. And Richard Dawkins writes in his book, I don't know an atheist who would bulldoze a cathedral like Chartres and Notre Dame. And I was speaking at the Academy of Sciences in Poland, and I read this out, and they stopped me, and they said, send them over to us. And then a, a very brilliant East German writer said, Dawkins is right, because cathedrals are too big for bulldozers. Stalin and Ulbricht used dynamite to blow them up. And I visited many holes in the ground where churches in hundreds were blown up. And to write that you can't imagine an atheist doing it means you don't understand 20th century history. And that leads me to be very suspicious. Because this kind of formula, blame it all on religion, all the suffering in the world, the moral suffering, exonerate atheism just won't work, ladies and gentlemen. I'll never forget, and it's happened more than once, a senior member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, and I've spent a lot of time there, because I wanted to know what atheism does to a society. I speak their language. He said to me, he said, John, we thought that we could abolish God and retain a value for human beings, and we found we couldn't. We murdered multi-millions of them. So every time you think of this accusation against religion, parallel it with the same thing when it comes to atheism. But of course, when we think about the big disasters, they tend to short-circuit our minds. We can't cope with the sheer quantity of it. And yet, as some people have pointed out, in one sense, you can't add suffering. Because suffering consists of individual suffering. 
And the maximum amount, in a sense, is the maximum amount that you as an individual can suffer. And you look at 9-11, it might have faded because your mum has just been diagnosed with cancer or you've had some awful experience and it fills your whole horizon. I understand that because we're all in the same boat with this. We all have to face these deep questions that are shaken to the surface when pain or moral evil hit us and we start to ask those deep, deep questions. And I want to make sure that you understand that I'm very sympathetic with those whose personal experience of suffering leads them to reject God. I have stood in Auschwitz many times and I've wept every time. Now, if we go into atheism, and I say I understand people that do that, I have many friends who do it. Let's take a reasoned look at that step. Is atheism the only belief system that is a reasonable response to suffering and evil? Well, listen to Dawkins' analysis of evil. I mentioned Richard Dawkins because most people have read his books and they're accessible. He says this, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. No good, no evil. The suicide bombers of 9-11 were dancing to the music of their DNA. That's the end of morality, ladies and gentlemen. And here comes the odd thing. Dawkins has abolished morality, and yet he's outraged at 9-11. There's a double think going on here. The logic of his atheism is to abolish morality, but that removes all grounds for his criticism. Now, of course, Nietzsche brilliantly saw this years ago. He said this, When one gives up Christian belief, one therefore deprives oneself of the right to Christian morality. Why morality, he asks, at all when life, nature, history are non-moral? Morality only possesses truth if God is truth. It stands or falls with belief in God. And that I count as an extremely important thing. Now, a question comes at this point. Why does God allow suffering anyway? Could he not create us without the capacity for moral evil and the universe without the propensity to fracture. And of course he could. Of course he could. He could have made us all robots, automatically programmed. But you know, I have a wife, I've been married 45 years, and I'm glad she's not a robot. Why is that? Because robots cannot love. Now here's the heart of one of the problems. You see, the capacity to love is a wonderful thing. But you wouldn't have it if God created a world in which everything was pre-programmed. Because that capacity to love depends on the capacity to choose. And if you're able to choose yes, you must be able to choose no. And it seems to me that C.S. Lewis and many other thinkers are exactly right when they trace a large part of this problem to the fact that we've chosen wrongly. And people who wish for a universe in which that wasn't possible actually logically are wishing themselves out of existence. Because you couldn't be in it. You with all your delightful capacities and the love that you experience in a world which by definition must have the possibility of experiencing hate. God took a risk, didn't he? I'm a parent, indeed I'm a grandparent, I have seven grandchildren, and I remember holding the first child and thinking, you know, this little girl could grow up to say no to me. Does that stop anybody having children? Why, why doesn't it? Because of the value of the love of a child and the expectation that if you as a parent do your best, there may be just a reward in the sense of a loving relationship, but you know it might go wrong. You still take the risk. And of course the big question comes, and we'll discuss that in um, our conversation. Granted that it's like that, did God make a big enough provision if things went wrong? Now my answer to that 
is detailed, but I'm only going to give you the first element of it now, and it's this. At the heart of Christianity is something utterly unique. It's a cross. And Nietzsche used to mockingly say, this God on the cross. But just come with me a moment. I know it's difficult for some of you who disagree with this, but if you're going to understand Christianity, you must at least listen to what it says. The claim is that Jesus was both God and human. So the question that Nietzsche mocked is very real. What is God doing on a cross? Well, at the very least this. It shows me that God has not remained distant from the problem of human suffering and evil, but has himself become part of it. Thank you very much.